I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Peripheral Challenging Case Competition, semifinal number one. Uh, I'm Tino Pena, uh, Matthew Boutin, and Madam um, Sinam are here as our, our three uh, moderators. Who are, we're not really judges, we're moderators. And really the goal today is we're going to have a case, a five-minute presentation, and then we'll have a short panel, maybe one or two questions or even comments about the interesting case, and then we'll proceed to the next uh, case presenter. And uh, we'll keep the flow going, okay? With that, I'll introduce, uh, Matt, he'll introduce the first speaker. Sure. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us. First up, we have Aditya uh, Sharma, who's gonna tell us about a 54-year-old male with a blue finger and three suspects. Great, thank you. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. I think you'll have a lot of uh, great procedural cases uh, but the one I'm actually going to present about is more of a diagnostic dilemma that we had and how we approach and treat. Um, and this was basically a 54-year-old gentleman who had um, presented with uh, his right uh, index finger with bluish discoloration. So, you know, very interesting case, 54-year-old, really no significant past medical history except for a little bit of diabetes. <laughs> pre-diabetes and hypertension, had three-week history of uh, right distal aspect of his index finger being blue, having bluish discoloration. Um, so, you know, on physical examination, his physical examination was fairly unremarkable, um, except for the fact that the right hand, when you examined it, you could see the bluish discoloration in about the distal half, two-thirds of his finger, um, and also he had a one-plus radial pulse. Uh, you know, he saw his uh, nurse practitioner first, who was referred to a, who referred him to a rheumatologist who had put him on anticoagulation. Um, actually, did proceed with doing some vascular studies. Uh, did receive a wrist brachial index, which you can see over here was fairly normal. Um, and uh, so here, the wrist brachial index was normal in this particular patient. But if you look at the digital waveforms, the right second digit, the, uh, the waveforms were fairly flattened and actually was a little bit of a lower amplitude even in the first digit. Um, as you would expect, the rheumatologist sort of proceeded with doing a bunch of hypercoagulable tests, rheumatological workup, all of it came back negative with mildly elevated homocysteine levels. He did undergo an echocardiogram that showed there was no evidence of any vegetation or thrombi noted. And the imaging quality was very good. So, he also did get a CTHS before he ended up seeing us. And, and the CTHS, they again did not see any significant atherosclerotic plaque. Um, the vessel walls did not appear thickened as you would see in any kind of arthritis, like giant cell arthritis or any form of vasculitis. So at this time, he was referred to us for further evaluation. And so, so when we see the blue finger, what are your typical differential diagnosis? Some of these have been excluded. As we know, cardiac etiology, vasculitis have been excluded. But what else would you think about it? And so when I look at these cases, you know, you have a gamut of things that you could still consider in somebody who's not a smoker. And sort of these kind of go through our list in our minds. Um, and so, you know, we started sort of slowly excluding what potentially could be the etiology. We didn't think this was arthritis based on the CTA. Um, it wasn't collagen vascular disease. We didn't think he had any physical findings that would make you concerning for, you know, Erlers Danlos or Louis Thiet syndrome, anything like that. Um, certainly was not, no evidence of uh, cholesterol embolism, um, no aneurysmal disease that we could initially note. Um, no evidence of cold injury or any kind of hematological disorder as was noted initially. So it kind of came down to these potential four differential diagnoses for us. It could be thoracic outlet syndrome, FMD, thrombosis, or hypothenar hammer syndrome. Um, and it's important to have this idea before you proceed with an angiogram because, you know, the way you do it would actually be a little different. So starting on with the first, you know, we proceeded with an angiogram. As you can see here, the subclavian actually looked quite clean. Um, and the axillary artery on initial study, um, and this was an adducted position. So to rule out potentially thoracic outlet syndrome, we proceeded with doing an angiogram on an abducted, um, adducted position, and you actually can see this mild compression over there of the subclavian at the thoracic outlet segment. Um, so here in an adducted position, you see there is no uh, narrowing noted. In abducted, there is some narrowing. Again, it's not very significant, but there is a mild narrowing that we do see. So, so again, this patient could potentially have thoracic outlet syndrome as a potential etiology for this presentation. Proceeded further with the angiogram, and you can notice here, as you see this sort of little bit of irregularity in the brachial artery, more in the mid and the distal aspect of the brachial artery. 
Uh, looking at it more closely, you can notice this over there, just magnifying it, and you see this irregular beaded-like appearance over the brachial artery. Um, and this is something that we, you know, as fibromuscular dysplasia, or very likely for fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, so this was another potential differential diagnosis for us. Um, and then proceeding further on, we did notice that um, uh, uh, distally his ulnar artery had this through like collateral appearance, and the radial artery also was occluded. And this is what would, would make us consider if this could be hypothenar hammer syndrome. So we started going through potential differential diagnosis for him, for these three. You know, we kind of went through this, first thought about could it, this be hypothenar? So we actually did the angiogram of the contralateral side. Didn't, we saw the same similar findings on the contralateral side, made us think this could be some kind of congenital anomaly. Plus, he didn't have any history that fit with vibratory tool use or things like that, which often is associated with hypothenar hammer. So we didn't think this was the potential etiology. Thoracic outlet was possible, but the compression was mild, and he did not have any post-stenotic subclavian aneurysm formation, which is typically what we see with th thrombosis. So it didn't seem like that was um, the e potential etiology. So we felt that this was put it, this is most likely brachial artery uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. CT actually did show that he had right external iliac artery FMD as well, and a left renal artery aneurysm. Um, thrombolysis, catheter direct thrombolysis didn't work for him, unfortunately, because the clot was three weeks old. By the time this was done, he actually had surgical resection of the thrombus and a graft placed and did pretty well after that. So, you know, just briefly about FMD. We think FMD in the brachial arteries is fairly rare, but I think this might be more underrepresented because we don't actually image them. Um, at my center, I have a pretty large number of patients with FMD. So we did scan in the last year, 66 patients had duplex scans for FMD, and we found that up to 26% of them had brachial FMD. And interestingly, there was a very strong correlation of presence of external iliac when they had brachial FMD as well. Um, so this is just a management approach, but a lot of these patients are asymptomatic, and typically we just use antiplatelet for them. If they are mildly symptomatic or moderately symptomatic, um, angioplasty is typically enough. Um, distal thromboembolism may require catheter-directed lysis or further surgical procedures for symptom relief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting case. I always say that when you're dealing with the hand and the finger, it's really a much more significant issue, particularly you know when patients have acute ischemic uh, changes to the fingers and, and, and how to treat them. Uh, I, I thought the differential was interesting. Was uh, very you know the way you went through it. I thought it was very interesting and good. Uh, I, again, I always to me, I think I treat a blue finger a lot. More, you know, it's, it's a bigger, it's more of an emergent issue than maybe a blue toe. I don't know why, but I mean I think a hand and a finger is so much more important to a per, to a patient. So having a, a good idea how you're going to evaluate them, and really be aggressive and quickly. You know, I mean this is something that I probably hopefully a patient was admitted and was getting this workup. You know. Yeah. Again, and I, I've learned that I, I, go, I go to angiography early, so. Yeah. All right, excellent case. Just one uh, quick question. What, what is uh, follow-up for these uh, patients, especially the brachial FMD? The brachial FMD. Do you FMD. have any experience with that? <laughs> so, you know, it's controversial, really. We don't have any data on it. Um, really, uh, you know, we did a um, sort of, there, there were just case reports of it. Just about last year, we actually combined it, our data with Cleveland Clinic, published some data, outcomes data, and really came up with that chart that I had shown at the end. And a lot of this is expert opinion, but often, you know, if, um, if they are mildly symptomatic, we just leave them on antiplatelet therapy, and that's just to avoid thromboembolic events. There's no real, you know, a lot of, this is just sort of thinking that if there's turbulence, there could be microthrombi, and they may end up with, uh, with a clot distally or so on. Um, so, so that's sort of what we, you know, do with that. Now, if they are fairly, if this gentleman had already been on an antiplatelet agent and then had a thromboembolic event, we would have potentially proceeded with angioplasting the brachial artery. But in this case, uh, we decided not to and just placed him on antiplatelet after the, the procedure was done. A really nice case, Aditya, and I, th I really like um, how you work through the differential. It makes a lot of sense. And it is something that probably requires angiography. Uh, when you see brachial FMD, do you treat that the same as if you see it in the renals or carotids as far as screening for aneurysms? Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. So, you know, what's interesting is I, I, we don't really look for brachial FMD as we look for renal or carotids when patients present to us. I, I, in the sake of time, I actually didn't show the fact that he had a CTA done 
and that did not show brachial FMD. So we still proceeded with the angiogram, and that's where we saw all these findings. And interestingly, we, when we did for, proceed with angiogram, we were really looking more for the hypothenar hammer uh, and the TOS evaluation. However, you know, this just came by incidentally. Um, and so, so I, 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 you know, so anecdotally, I think when we look through these, if you have hemodynamic stenosis, sometimes a duplex might be better if done properly um, than a CTA in these scenarios. That's so, right. yeah, right. it's, it's right. kind well, of interesting. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks. Uh, to keep us on time, uh, we'll have Dr. Gupta present his case of simultaneous aortal bifemoral and femoral to popliteal bypass. Okay, uh, so I want to start by thanking everyone for having me and then thanking my faculty mentor, Dr. Sai, who's not here yet, but she'll be here later in the weekend. So I'm presenting a case of a 59-year-old white male that was referred to our vascular surgery clinic uh, for bilateral, claudica bilateral calf claudication, left side worse than the right. Uh, his symptoms got progressively worse to where he was having pain after walking 30 to 40 feet and eventually did progress to rest pain. We had problems differentiating rest pain from his severe baseline diabetic neuropathy uh, because he described a constant pins and needles sensation in both of his feet, even at rest. Past medical history, usual suspects, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, AFib, coronary artery disease. He had three STEMIs in the last 15 years, and then peripheral artery disease. Surgical, he had two PCIs with a drug-eluting stent in the proximal lad. He uh, had a pelvic arteriogram at an outside hospital with left external iliac stenting. And he was a two-pack per day smoker on Xarelto, insulin, beta blocker, amlodipine, aspirin, and a statin. For his exam, he had non-palpable femoral and palpiteal pulses, and he had Doppler signal at the posterior tibial bilaterally, uh, dependent rubber bilaterally, and he did have tissue loss. He had gangrenous changes on the left foot of the third and fourth toes, as well as cellulitis to the midfoot. For his studies, he had leukocytosis to 16,000 with an elevated CRP, and his non-invasive studies showed um, ABIs right around 0.45, and then toe pressure on the right of 52 and on the left of 40 and uh, he had significant blunting of his pulse volume recordings at the level of the thigh, suggesting severe inflow disease. Given his history, we decided to get a preoperative cardiac evaluation. Uh, his NST showed an inferolateral wall perfusion defect concern concerning for ischemia with preserved EF. Uh, he did go for left heart cath that showed sta stable two-vessel coronary artery disease with a patent stent. So I'm going to show these images in a second, but just to give you guys an, uh, an idea of what to look for, he had severe multilevel disease bilaterally with right external iliac stenosis. His right common fem was out. Uh, his right profunda was, was patent, but uh, just barely. And then he, his left external iliac stent was occluded with common femoral stenosis, SFA disease, and also an occluded left main profunda as well. So we'll go through these images. Um, this is just one representative scan for him. It's going to scroll through kind of slowly, but once the findings come, they find pretty quickly. So as we go down, you'll start seeing his some common iliac disease, and then we'll come up on his occluded stent on the left right there. You can see that the right external iliac is patent slightly, and we'll keep going down. You'll see that both profundas are out as well. There's some outflow uh, as we go more down. It's uh, better on the right than on the left. And that should be basically it. Okay, great. So we know that concurrent inflow and outflow procedures, uh, especially with an aorta bifemoral bypass, are very rare. And we went through a lot of different options for, to address this tissue loss on the left side. We thought about a femoral endarterectomy an iliac stent and then distal bypass, so a one-sided procedure. Uh, we also thought about endo options or a different open revascularization with an ax by fem. But given his anatomy and uh, his tissue loss and his bilateral rest pain, there were no really good endo-staged or unilateral options. So like I mentioned, we did the cardiac workup and then proceeded with the uh, aortobifemoral bypass with concurrent left femoral to posterior tibial bypass. So in the operating room, we did the AFB with the 16 by 8 Dacron graft. We did a left femoral to posterior tibial bypass with a non-reverse saphenous vein from the left side. Uh, he also had a right common femoral endarterectomy with a small amount of profundoplasty. And then we re-implanted the inferior mesenteric artery at the end of the case as well. 
Postoperatively, the patient did well. He had a palpable left posterior tibial pulse right out of the operating room. His toe pressures the next day were 67 and 86, so a significant improvement. Uh, within 30 days, he did develop a seroma in the left leg vein harvest site that was evacuated without any issues. Uh, his tissue loss did heal, and his claudication and rest pain improved. So uh, just briefly, a small discussion. 50% uh, of patients that make it to the operating room for aortoiliac, uh, uh, who make it to the operating room for aortoiliac surgery for peripheral arterial disease have, uh, have multi-level disease. And traditionally, this was described as to, uh, to be treated with an inflow procedure only, but data and studies have shown that of the patients that have an inflow procedure, 25 to 33% will inevitably need a distal bypass uh, as well. And initially, it was thought that these distal bypasses don't have a good patency rate if you do them concurrently, but new studies have shown that patency is as high as 90% at two years and 70 to 80% at four years. So these procedures do have utility uh, in multi-level disease. So these are my references. Uh, thanks for having me. I'll open it up to any questions. Again, very interesting case. Mm -hmm. um, really thought the use of imaging here to help really, you made a decision that the patient needed to be revascularized. Being able to use then the CTA to really plan your procedure, I think is really helpful. You probably prevented, you know, having to at least do some kind of angiogram or do some kind of invasive procedure by being able to plan this. Would your plan have been different if the patient was, let's say, Rutherford class three, um, you know, a clodicant, as opposed to someone with an ulcer in a Rutherford class five? Would that have changed what you did? That's actually an excellent question, something that we discussed a lot. We had known this patient from earlier when he was only a clodicant without tissue loss, and the plan was an AFB, possibly, um, but it's not generally our practice to do an advanced open procedure for just claudication. Uh, you know, we know that the risk of limb loss is a little bit lower with claudication, but once they progress to rest pain or tissue loss, the risk of amputation goes significantly higher, and that's why we made the decision to uh, perform the concurrent operations. Excellent case, again. Um, just curious about, uh, did you guys think about any medical therapy changes after this? Because one, you know, this is a gentleman who's, mm -hmm. who's had significant coronary disease. Mm -hmm. Now he's got multi-level peripheral mm -hmm. artery disease. Mm -hmm. So his five-year survival mm -hmm. is not gonna be as great as somebody who, without right. any of these. So right. any consideration for medical therapy changes? So because I'm just a resident, I rotated off the service before he was able to follow up, but I do know that he was uh, inserted into um, a graduate, he was inserted into an exercise program as well as a smoking cessation clinic because while he was compliant with medications, he would just not stop smoking. So those are the two things I know for sure that we did for risk factor, risk factor modification. Well, great case, very mm -hmm. complex. They don't come much more challenging. I wonder if your approach had, would have been different had this guy been bypassed and not had autologous vein graft to use for that from pop. Uh, uh, so that's a tough question. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I do know that he did have good vein on the right. Uh -huh. So he had some good vein on the right side. Um, we probably still would have proceeded and used um, a prosthetic graft for the bypass, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Sure, great. Well, yeah. thank you very awesome. much. No problem. Thank you so much. All right, well, uh, welcome Dr. Fanari to the podium for uh, his presentation of endovascular repair of complex juxtarenal aortic aneurysm using a combined fenestrated endograft and chimney technique. Thank you very much for having me here today. So today we're uh, going to present uh, this case about this complex patient. He's uh, um, an 84-year-old uh, gentleman with vast medical history of coronary artery disease uh, with history of cabbage. His ischemic cardiomyopathy was EF of 35 to 40%. Um, he, he presented to us with a 6.2 infrarenal uh, aortic, abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, with a very complex anatomy, uh, which I'll show in the CT in a little bit. The problem is with this aneurysm Basically, it uh, arises immediately below the level of renal arteries. It extends just above the iliac bifurcations, and the patient also have occluded celiac and inferior mesenteric artery, and had severe bilateral renal artery stenosis of 90%. Um, and to complicate things more, uh, his right renal artery was oriented coldly, and the left was uh, oriented cranially. So we discussed this case with vascular surgeons, 
who said that this patient, given his age, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, um, and many other comorbidities, he was really high risk for surgical intervention, so a decision was made to do endovascular repair. Um, even actually, uh, he was actually also turned down by surgeons uh, for endografting with fenestrated grafts in the past, so we ended up doing it out, uh, ourselves. So here is the CT, and if you can uh, appreciate here, you can see the angulation here. It's very tough angulation. You can see um, the aneurysm. This, these are the renal arteries here. You can see the aneurysm. These are the renal arteries again. You can see the aneurysm extending all the way to the renal arteries. And here you can uh, appreciate on this image here how uh, prominent is the superior mesentric artery because basically it's giving flow to all the areas that should be covered by the celiac and inferior mesentric. And you can see the orientation of uh, the renal arteries as well uh, here in opposite uh, directions. So um, giving the, the opposite directions of the renal, uh, obviously we needed to treat this with uh, in the, uh, with, with fenestrated graft, but given uh, the opposite direction of these renal arteries, it is recommended then, uh, then when the right renal artery is orient, uh, oriented this way that you can do uh, snorkel. So uh, it's only reported once that uh, a combination between snorkel and fenestrated graft is done. So we only saw it in a meeting, actually, uh, abstract. So we, dis we discussed it with... Uh, uh, we discussed among ourselves and with the makers of the cook fenestration, and we decided this is, was uh, the best way to do it. So basically what we did, uh, we uh, first accessed the brachial artery, and we barked uh, a via band, a balloon expandable stents from the brachial artery uh, in the right uh, renal artery, as you can see here. And then we advanced uh, the fenestrated graft from the right common femoral artery, like that. Then we actually, uh, uh, after that, uh, we deployed the upper part of the uh, fenestrated graft, as you can see, and we accessed these, uh, the superior mesentric artery and the uh, left renal artery using a gel sheet from the left groin, uh, one by one. Basically, we access one, put the stiff wire, and then access the other one. This process here was just uh, I mean, it shows in one picture here, this process actually accessing these two, this actually, this was the longest part of the procedure. This part took actually one hour to do. Um, so after we barked these two stents, we barked 6 by 22 uh, eye cast in the left renal artery and 8 by 29 uh, millimeter uh, VBX in the left renal artery, we moved for the next step. And that step, basically, we first deployed the uh, v, the right VBX from, uh, that we barked earlier from the right brachial artery. And at the same time, we both dilated, at the same time, we both dilated the graft here with the reliant balloon. We got really good result there. And then, subsequently, we deployed the uh, two stents we barked in the SMA. Here you can see us deploying the SMA stent. And next, we deployed the left renal artery stent. After that step, uh, it went back to be as any uh, uh, repair. So basically, we uh, deployed the rest of the fenestrated graft and did both iliac limbs. And we got, uh, this is the final images here. And you can see here, you can see the renal arteries and you can see the SMA filling really well. So um, the main reason why I wanted to show this case that um, people think uh, about these two strategies, using fenestrated grafts or Shemini strategies as competing strategies, but in, in, in reality, you can combine uh, these strategies in, in cases that require that, and uh, this case is a good example of that. Thank you very much. Again, uh, another great case. You guys are really showing great cases here. I mean, my, my first question always has to do with the indication, right? Yes. We have an 84-year-old gentleman already with bilateral renal artery stenosis, basically living on an SMA, right? So yeah. me personally, I hate touching the SMA. And if I know it's the only vessel keeping his bowel alive, I hate yeah. it even more. You know, what kind of discussions do you have to have with the patient? How do you assess? Right. How do you assess? You know, everyone says, oh, he's a good 84. 
How do you assess that? And, yeah, and tell yeah. me a little bit about that right. decision. Because obviously, right. we can do a lot of different things. When do right. we make the decision if this is the right thing to do in this particular patient? So uh, in this patient, we had, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, this patient was seeing, it's, it's known that he had this aneurysm, and it's followed very closely. So uh, this uh, aneurysm grew, uh, grew from uh, 5.5 to 6.2 within three months. So that growth is, was very, very, very concerning. So 5.5 is when he saw the surgeon got uh, uh, turned down, and 6.2 when we say, like, you know, let's look at, at it and see what's going on. So that growth is very concerning that this aneurysm was going to rupture anytime soon. So obviously the patient was, it, it, uh, and the problem with this as well is, you know, you're getting the CT scan, you're going to ask for the fenestrated graph, which takes like four to six weeks to be done, right? Um, so uh, that's part of why it took longer probably to engage the other arteries because it grew a little bit more. Um, so we discussed it with the patient explaining, hey, uh, if we don't do anything, this is growing really fast and uh, there's very high chance you're going uh, uh, to die. But if we do this, this is very high risk procedure. You may actually, if we occlude the SMA and we're not able to open it up, um, then, we, uh, then you may die from bowel, of, of bowel ischemia. And we were very clear with that. Because yes, we knew like, you know, the right renal, we've got that, at least we have one renal artery uh, protected. But the main problem was the SMA. And we were very clear with the patient that uh, the, the, the mortality risk in this procedure is very high, but it is higher if we don't do anything. So again, I think that discussion, that, that's a crucial part. That should be a crucial part of your documentation. And I think you know, if we learn anything from you know, TAVR, TAVR meetings and structural heart, as we're dealing with these very you know, older patients, yeah. you know, justifying why you're doing these procedures, looking at you know, with frailty, all these things are things that I think are translational. So. Once again, a phenomenal case, uh, an excellent presentation. I'm just curious, uh, the AAA post-procedure follow-up is fairly straightforward. What's the imaging follow-up, or is there any imaging follow-up for all the other ICAS tents that you placed? Right. Um, and, and medical therapy also, I just have to ask about the medications and the platelets. Right, uh, so uh, <laughs> this patient was uh, placed on uh, dual antiplatelets and actually we, our plan was to keep the dual antiplatelets as long as we can. Uh, follow up, um, obviously we're doing the CAT, the CT, but uh, we were always prepared if the CT images were not good enough to, to do uh, arterial doubler for the renal arteries and uh, uh, visceral dober versus uh, angiography if needed. Um, this patient is followed up actually already six months now, and this CAT scan actually showed very good flow in all. The good thing about the SMA is really big, so it's very easy. Uh, I mean, if you don't see it on the CAT scan, you know it's not there. So uh, renal arteries filled really well, but uh, we were thinking about renal dobler if we needed to. Yeah. Great. Well, great case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, to keep us. Please. Again, going back to that question, so I think it's really important to the antiplatelet medications follow these patients. You really want to know every time you see them, you want to know whether creatinine is your renal function. That may be one of the first keys you may get that something's going on with those renal stents. And then the SMA, you, it's a combination of CT with ultrasound. A lot of these patients' renal function may be, you may, may be limited. You may have to do CT and ultrasound. So great question, great discussion. Yeah, those are great points. Thank you very much. All right, well, we'll uh, welcome Dr. Pajau to the uh, podium to present his case of percutaneous femoral popliteal bypass for long SFA occlusions. All right. Okay, good morning, everybody. So this is uh, not, well, it's not advancing for some reason. There we go. So this is not just a case presentation, but, but hopefully an opportunity to talk about a new technology that may become an option in a, in a fairly narrow but uh, relevant uh, patient population. So disclosures were talked about. So these are the two cases I'm going to talk about. These were actually the first two cases done in the United States uh, uh, to launch this new uh, revascularization technology. The first patient is a 69-year-old woman. She has the usual risk factors for PAD. She's had a procedure on the, her uh, right leg. She still has claudication on her left leg. 
in uh, her CTA shows a fairly long um, left SFA lesion. The CTO segment itself is 16 centimeters, but there's also diffuse disease in the proximal segment. The second patient is 76, has a bunch of risk factors, has CAD, has had cabbage, um, has pretty significant uh, claudication on his left leg. They tried to open it up percutaneously at an outside hospital, were not able to cross. CTA shows, again, a long SFA lesion. This time the CTO segment is 13 centimeters long. There's heavy calcification. Uh, and there's also very diffuse disease proximally and distally. So these are patients we tackle uh, percutaneously, not infrequently, but they're, they're challenging. And sometimes the final results are, are not, not what we would like it to be. You, you go over uh, calcified nodules, you go through some intimal tracts, and sometimes your stent, even though you can expand it, uh, is not a straight line and has turbulent flow and shear stress problems. Um, and percutaneously, we do a very good job in the simpler lesions as far as long-term patency goes. But unfortunately, at least on historical data, for the more complex, longer lesions, the percutaneous patency is not uh, 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 as good as we would like it to be. So this is uh, designed to be an option for patients who have very long, complex SFA lesions to perform a FEMPOP graft without open surgery. So this is the picture of the first patient. Um, you see the, the proximal SFA has some disease, but after it reconstitutes, the distal SFA and the popliteal artery are pretty good. Mm, how do I click this? There we go. So this is a picture on patient two. There's also diffuse disease proximally, a lot of calcification in the mid SFA, um, and the reconstitution through a large collateral. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to get uh, venous access, usually in the posterior tibial vein, put a seven French sheet there, arterial access on the contralateral side, up and over in the usual fashion with an eight French system. Uh, in the proximal SFA, we're going to park this crossing catheter. In the femoral vein, right next to it, you're going to put this snare with two baskets. Uh, with fluoroscopic guidance, you're going to fire the needle, which is a long needle, much, much longer and, and, and stiffer than your outback needles. Uh, fire that into the basket, withdraw the needle, and carefully advance uh, 014 wire. You capture the wire with the snare and externalize it through the venous uh, access site. You need to predilate the crossing site. You're crossing all layers of the um, SFA, so it takes a lot of pressure to actually expand this. After you do that, you use that same crossing catheter, this time from the venous side under angiographic guidance, you fire that needle back into the distal SFA and advance your 014 wire that way. Um, after you predilate the distal crossing site, you exchange for um, 035 wire and you start deploying these grafts. This is a, is a, a different graft than, than that's proprietary to this technology. It has about three times the radial strength of a viable. When they started doing these uh, as a proof of concept study, the, the self-expanding covered grafts were just collapsing at the crossing site. So this is much sturdier than, than what we have available now. It usually takes two to three grafts to complete this uh, percutaneous fan pop. After you do that, you post-dilate the crossing sites and the, the overlapping segments. And this is the final result. It's a pretty straight path without a whole lot of, uh, of, of turbulent flow, hopefully. Um, and you pretty much cover the SFA from its ostium until the, the healthy part, which should be at least five centimeters above the tibial plateau. Uh, on the vein side, you do a venogram. Uh, to, to be a candidate for this study, you need to have either duplicate uh, femoral veins or femoral vein that's over a centimeter in diameter. The graft is gonna take seven centimeters out of that. And even though you can see the graft occupying space within the vein, there's still plenty of brisk flow through it. Uh, this is the data we have so far. So these were the first uh, uh, two patients done as part of the IDE trial mandated by the FDA. Uh, we've done about 20 so far. But uh, the CMARC study was just presented. And it was 77 patients with very long uh, SFA lesions. The mean lesion length was 37 centimeters. This is not a population we usually include in, in, in many studies. Uh, they were mostly CTOs. The majority had severe calcification. Endpoint was patency and safety endpoints included some venous uh, uh, scores and DVT. 
In this very early experience, primary patency at one year was 72.5%. Uh, uh, secondary patency was 93.8%. Procedural success was uh, uh, almost 99%. One patient was uh, randomized but not treated, not attempted. Um, and in most of these failures, uh, uh, there was a clear procedural problem that was identified and hopefully corrected for the new generation of devices. There was no DVT within 30 days. There were two DVTs uh, 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 from, from uh, 30 days to one year. They were treated and, and resolved with three months of anticoagulation. Um, and we are currently uh, uh, um, rolling this um, IDE study and hopefully we'll have more information soon. Great, thank you very much. Very interesting technology for a solution of a long, uh, long SFA uh, diseases. When the stent goes in the vein, does there still flow in the vein alongside of it? Yeah, so th that's, uh, that's the reason for those sort of venograms to demonstrate that. And not every, some patients will screen out because their common femorals are, are narrow, too narrow or they, there's no duplicate. Um, you, you do need to, to have a, a, a flow on, on your common femoral veins, uh, femoral veins, and that seems to be preserved, even though you're occupying uh, uh, some real state in that. Excellent case. Uh, I don't have any questions. Good case. Okay, there's a question great, in the back uh, there. Uh, great case. Very interesting presentation. Thank so, you. One question. When we're doing intervascular procedures, we're always concerned and appropriately so about taking away surgical options. It seems to me that when you're doing this procedure, you're taking away some intervascular options. Yeah. You certainly are. You certainly are. You're not getting back to that SFA. Uh, anything that will be done will be done to that graft, either percutaneously or surgically. So yeah, that, that's a very valid point. Yeah, actually, that's a, a great point, and I was going to ask about that very same thing. Um, uh, you know, femoral popliteal bypass with a saphenous vein graft is still a great operation. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit more about um, patient selection here, and what, what sort of patients are you looking for, particularly in context of calcification, thinking about you needing to exit and re-enter the artery. A lot of these arteries are really heavily calcified too. Yeah, so the, the, the CTA uh, analysis prior to this procedure is really critical. Um, you not only need to have a, a, a relatively healthy uh, distal SFA, the, the, the proximal crossing side is usually not an issue because you, you're going to cover that, that remaining SFA with a covered graft anyway. Um, you want to you want to see if there's not just a huge chunk of calcium. Uh, the crossing can vary. You can on the proximal crossing side you can cross lower or or or, or higher than a big chunk of calcium. On the distal SFA, some patients have screened out because they had too much calcification there and not a really good spot to cross before it gets too close to the knee. You don't want to park your graft uh, uh, too close to the knee. Um, and as far as uh, uh, Patients being a candidate for FEMPOP, and FEMPOP is a great, great operation, especially if you have a, a vein conduit. Uh, uh, if a patient is, has a reasonable surgical risk, that should be the way to go. Again, this is a niche uh, uh, technology that uh, it's not gonna be the answer for everybody, but I think it may be a good option for some people. And uh, what about management of uh, DVT or, or prophylaxis, I guess, for DVT? I would be pretty reluctant to have these folks on anything less than dual antiplatelet therapy for the long term, considering using a long endograft, and then you've yeah. also got that endograft in the vein. occupying the vein, so yeah. this might be a, a case where we're more aggressive with anticoagulation. Yeah, so in the trial, in that CMARC study, they were kept on dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months, and, and that's uh, when we saw that no DVT early on, two DVTs from, from uh, th 30 days to a year. For the U.S. trial, the follow-up is going to be three years. So the trial is mandating three years of dual antiplatelet therapy. Once uh, uh, rivaroxaban gets sort of a, a vascular uh, uh, indication, that may be a good discussion on whether or not they may do better on Plavix and low-dose rivaroxaban than on uh, aspirin and Plavix. But as of now, we are planning on treating these patients with aspirin and Plavix uh, for the duration of the study, which is three years. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on, uh, we'll invite uh, Dr. Azam to the podium to discuss successful intervention of CTO, the SFA, after a failed bypass. Uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, nice presentations and discussion. 
Uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist practicing in Nebraska. We'll uh, be talking uh, this first uh, presentation. Um, is about iliac and SFA uh, intervention of chronic total occlusion. So uh, this is a 66-year-old uh, gentleman known to have peripheral vascular disease. He's been having uh, shortness of breath, severe leg pain, and numbness with exertion and at rest involving these, uh, his legs. In 2009, he had unsuccessful attempt at intervention of the right uh, SFA. In 2010, he underwent right FEMPOP as well as right to left FEMFEM bypass at a community hospital. A year later, he had bilateral aorto by profunda bypass at a uh, university hospital. Uh, when he came uh, to my clinic uh, for the first time, we, uh, he was uh, examined, evaluated, and uh, arterial duplex uh, showed occluded FEMFEM graft bilateral SFA were also occluded, uh, uh, blood, uh, the, the vessels reconstituted at the level of the peroneal and the anterior tibial arteries. So I did a, uh, a CTA uh, of abdomen and uh, runoff uh, here. Good. So uh, there's no aneurysm. Um, the, the, this is the aorto by profunda bypass. You see here the native iliacs are totally occluded, there's nothing in the uh, iliac system, common, external, internal. The right side reconstitutes at the level of the popliteal artery. Uh, the left side reconstitutes at uh, the uh, distal SFA. Uh, runoff, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, below the right knee, there is like two to one and a half uh, vessel runoff there and uh, one to one and a half uh, left side. So uh, he was, uh, this was discussed again uh, with the patient and uh, options were, uh, were discussed whether he wants to go for uh, surgical evaluation, uh, see what uh, uh, they can do. He absolutely uh, refused. He was uh, brought uh, to the cath lab. I uh, obtained a uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right radial arterial axis, placed a 5, 6 uh, French slender uh, sheath advanced a uh, multipurpose uh, diagnostic catheter over uh, advantage wire. I had to use uh, the uh, pigtail catheter, try to deflect it away, and then uh, introduced, uh, uh, exchange it out for multipurpose. So uh, I also obtained a, uh, under ultrasound guidance, uh, an anterior uh, tibial arterial uh, axis. Initially placed a 4-5 uh, French slender sheath uh, then advanced a uh, glide wire uh, uh, advantage and uh, uh, an over the wire catheter. I believe it was uh, um, uh, trailblazer at that time. So um, I uh, tried to intervene from below, um, advance it all the way up to the uh, common femoral. This is the uh, trailblazer, uh, but nothing would uh, pass beyond this point. Uh, the CTO, um, I, I ballooned it at that point and uh, uh, tried uh, using a uh, stiff glide uh, catheter trying to uh, penetrate that gap in the common femoral without any success. I tried uh, Pilot 200 uh, and uh, Confianza, uh, no success. C uh, Command uh, uh, 0118, uh, Astato, absolutely nothing. Uh, Guy a third actually uh, did uh, make some progress. I tried at some point also to, to intervene also uh, fr from above, uh, no success. So uh, I used a Navicross and Guy a third was able to, to make some progress here, then uh, advance the catheter. Uh, it, it actually deflected itself down and uh, at that point I was uh, sure I'm in a true lumen, I injected here. Uh, I was in the internal uh, iliac, then uh, pulled it back and deflected back up, advanced guy a third, all the way up to the uh, uh, aorta. I uh, compared pressure and made sure that I was in the true lumen in the aorta, which was the case. 
Uh, after that, I uh, advanced multiple balloons uh, from below uh, uh, the pedal axis, um, then uh, advanced a uh, glide advantage in the multipurpose uh, guiding catheter all the way down to the popliteal artery. Then, uh, at that time, I did not want the, the, the size of the, of the vessel would not, uh, of the pedal artery would not accept uh, a seven French. Uh, also, I was uh, uh, anxious that some perforation of the internal iliac might happen. At that time, I had uh, just inflated only four uh, millimeter balloons. So I had to uh, go over a stiff wire uh, uh, using uh, the radial arterial axis. Uh, you, uh, I uh, uh, upgraded the system up for a seven French 90 centimeter uh, sheath. Uh, parked it as far uh, as I could and uh, guided uh, the deployment of uh, uh, two uh, uh, stents in the iliac system by injecting uh, from below. So uh, an 8059 uh, Omnilink uh, was uh, uh, deployed across the uh, common uh, femoral artery, then an 8080 uh, self-expanding uh, to cover uh, distal to that with some overlap. Uh, this is NGO after the stents were placed. Uh, still, uh, work was, uh, was not uh, finished across the uh, distal SFA popliteal. Um, so advancing stents from above uh, will not, uh, will not, uh, will not uh, th they won't reach. So uh, I upgraded the uh, pedal axis to five, uh, six uh, um, uh, slender sheath. Then I advanced, uh, was able to deploy a 60150 uh, pulsar and 6.560 supera uh, stents. Um, then uh, these are uh, the final pictures. We did some post dilatation, and uh, this is the final runoff. Uh, great uh, uh, iliac uh, system, uh, no perforation. Uh, this is the stump of uh, the previous uh, uh, surgery. Uh, SFA is wide open, stents uh, very well expanded, and uh, 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 the following day we did uh, ultrasound just to assure that uh, we still had flow in the anterior tibial artery and make sure that we have at least biphasic uh, flow. Uh, his symptoms in, uh, in that leg uh, improved. Uh, we brought him actually uh, a few weeks later and intervened on the left side uh, using the same technique. Extremely uh, interesting case. I'm tired just hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, usually, you know, it's the other way around, right? We start with endovascular and you have surgery to, you know, after we run out of options. And here you're, you're back to trying to do something of an endovascular standpoint. And I think once we're in that point, you know, kind of all our standard things go out the door. You know, we're trying to try to get flow into the foot as best we can and to the extremity as best we can. Um, obviously, a lot of different decisions that you have to make during this case. And, um, you know, I'm curious to see just what your plan was before you started and how that changed. And then your concern about, you know, when I've attacked these kind of cases, I try to get back into that surgical graft. I try to get back into that surgical graft because, you know, you, now you've done this, now do you have a competing graft there? And you don't, you know, if I take it out or if it goes down, is it going to compromise the other leg? Mm -hmm. And that's always been a concern of mine. So uh, more of a comment, but I know a question. You know, before you started, you knew, I mean, this must have been a whole day affair, right? Yeah. And, I, you know, how you kind of talk to the patient and then when you were there, how, you know, these decisions, at any time did you say, okay, I got to stop and come back, or is this multiple stage procedures, or just one? And then the last thing is, did you think, ever think about getting into the graft, and, you know, you, with the use of the outback and this and that, sometimes you can come up and then, okay, to me, once you get in the pelvis, the risks go up, right? Mm -hmm, because like sure. you said, you don't have a lot of backup, right? Mm -hmm. You got something in the wrist, and you have something in the foot. Right. You don't have a lot of backup. So I try to stay away from the pelvis and you know, maybe an alpaca or something that I can get in and work with that in infrainguinal stuff where I can at least control. Right. 
Uh, so uh, actually, before uh, that CTA was done, before uh, uh, we, we started the, the procedure uh, uh, in preparation for it, I uh, sat with the with the radiologist trying to see whether there is any way to tell whether uh, uh, it would uh, be a good idea actually to try to recanalize that uh, graft or at least find anything. There is absolutely nothing, no no indication that other than scar tissue, we couldn't find anything. The other thing that I had in mind is that once I started start uh, advancing wires, whether I'll uh, uh, shower thrombi everywhere down, and then I create a problem that I'm sure I can't bail myself out of. Excellent case, uh, again. Uh, just a couple quick comments, maybe. Sure. Um, radial versus brachial axis here. Uh, brachial would have saved you uh, some trouble. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a high-risk case. so. If it's not a high risk case, then you can question saying brachial axis have more complications. But here, brachial axis could have allowed you to use even eight French systems. You know, most brachial arteries can take eight French. That's number one. And uh, number two, again, along the same point, task D, uh, long iliac occlusions. Some people do advocate placing stent grafts in mm -hmm. the ICAS, which would have been a limitation for you because of your seven French system. So True. your thoughts on those two? Yeah, well, uh, back, back to the surgical option. Uh, you know, uh, he, he was literally sick of uh, seeing surgeons. You know, he, uh, 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 he absolutely uh, uh, did not agree. Uh, uh, he didn't want to see any local vascular surgeon, uh, whether at our hospital or uh, the other in the community. He did not want to go back to either Creighton or uh, Omaha, uh, UNMC. Uh, absolute, uh, surgery was definitely out for him. Yeah. Okay, great case, very complex. Um, are you presenting our next case? Yes. Okay, great. Well, for the sake of time, why don't we move on to that next case? Sure. So the next uh, case is going to be an il iliac? Yes. Okay. Iliac case. Great. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, until they, they uh, load up, you know, brachial, I'm, uh, uh, I'm truly hesitant always to, to use it. I mean, uh, uh, when, when we sometimes also have to uh, use any trench system, let's say for, for the heart, a CT or something, I might go uh, sheathless, you know, very carefully in the radial, trying not to really touch the, the brachial. Uh, so, sorry. So, uh, the, the next presentation is uh, about an intervention of chronic total occlusion of the iliac artery. Uh, this is a 50 year, uh, sorry, 54 year old uh, gentleman with severe peripheral vascular disease. This was found by actually a vascular surgeon longer than 10 years ago. He treated him with exercise uh, and celostazole. His primary care physician uh, started him on uh, baby aspirin in addition to celostazole and uh, statin and uh, losartan or lisinopril. Uh, patient uh, came to me uh, for a second opinion because for the last uh, two to three years, he's been having significant intermittent claudications uh, upon uh, walking less than uh, 100 uh, yards. Uh, so uh, he continues to smoke. He, uh, uh, he did not want to, to stop. Uh, we did ABI at the office. Uh, the right was uh, 0.5, left was uh, 0.4. I did CTA, uh, which showed bilateral occlusion of the external iliacs and uh, uh, the right common iliac with great uh, runoff. Again, uh, you know, uh, uh, aorto uh, bifem uh, probably uh, or, or, or is, is a great option for him. He's, he's young. Uh, he absolutely uh, refused surgery. Uh, he uh, refused even to see his own vascular uh, surgeon. So I brought him to the cath lab. Uh, I went radial uh, approach, uh, uh, selected the left uh, uh, iliac artery with a long multipurpose uh, diagnostic catheter. When I saw this picture, I was uh, very optimistic that actually things will go fast just because there is that pointed nub, probably an 014 or uh, 018 will, will just uh, go uh, uh, through. Uh, it didn't happen. So uh, I got a uh, posterior tibial uh, access under uh, ultrasound guidance. Um, then uh, try to continue to try to uh, open it up from from above. Uh, no, uh, no success. 
Um, so uh, I used uh, an 035 Glide Advantage wire and Trailblazer uh, capture uh, uh, retrogradely. Um, didn't cross. Um, I used uh, initially a Pilot uh, 200, uh, then uh, uh, Confianza Pro 12. Uh, along with Trailblazer, uh, the wire did uh, uh, make it all the way up to the aorta, but not the catheter, so I exchanged it out for a Corsair. Uh, after that, I uh, re-advanced uh, um, Trailblazer. It, it did cross. I uh, ballooned uh, at that time the Iliac. So this case actually was, was done before that one, uh, before the one I just presented. Sorry. Uh, at that time... I uh, realized that there is something wrong. The, the shape of the bladder is not what it used to be. The patient at that time was still hemodynamically stable, but definitely th there is something wrong. And at that time, th this was done two and a half years ago, I believe. Uh, at that time, I, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't have any seven French system in the patient's body, so I had to uh, move real fast. Uh, I didn't uh, uh, reverse heparin at that time uh, because I have a pedal uh, access. Uh, what I did is that because uh, the size of, uh, he's a big guy, because of the size of the uh, uh, posterior tibial w was good, I exchanged the sheath out for a 6-7 uh, French uh, over the same uh, wire and then uh, uh, used a uh, NATO 100 uh, Viavan. Uh, it sealed it. Uh, things continue. Uh, things uh, went well after that, but uh, Angio, I wasn't happy of the internal iliac, and for such a, a young individual, I didn't uh, want to leave it that way. So I exchanged the diagnostic catheter uh, from the radial artery out for a, um, a long multipurpose guide. I advanced pilot 50 wire into the left internal iliac, used a 40 coronary balloon and 60 uh, via trek, uh, inflated. Uh, 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 I inflated them across the osteum of the internal uh, iliac. Then I did simultaneous kissing uh, balloon from below and above, and uh, th there was uh, dissection. Uh, before I did that, there was some dissection um, uh, right proximal to, to that dry bond. I kept these balloons up for uh, five uh, minutes. Still, uh, it didn't, uh, I wasn't happy. So uh, I deployed a uh, 9040 uh, Absolute Pro right proximal to that uh, stent, uh, preserving the iliac. This is the final picture, great flow in the internal iliac, uh, iliofemoral, and uh, below the knee arteries. Um, we didn't have to uh, start him on pressors or, uh, or resuscitate him. No blood transfusion. Yeah, so th this actually taught me that once I uh, start uh, ballooning uh, in, uh, across the internal iliac, a seven French has to be uh, there, yeah. And this is what I did with the uh, following one. Great case, again, um, a lot of teaching points here, a, a lot of very, a lot of interest. First of all, I always say that when you're dealing with an occlusion in the iliac, you have to assume it's going to rupture. So yep. everything is ready. You're assuming it's going to rupture. And again, was the patient under moderate sedation? Did the patient give you any indication that something could be going on here? No, or? nothing. Absolutely no, nothing. Usually, some, yeah. most of the times, nope. mine they, they they tell me before I can figure it out. It's it's actually interesting. Yeah. Actually, there was absolutely no symptom. Blood pressure uh, continued to be okay. It's interesting that I was explaining to the tech and the staff that, you know, one of the things that you always have to keep in mind, if, if any artery will give you some trouble in the, periphery, uh, in the peripherals uh, beyond the, the, below the aorta, it would be the external iliac. And I said, one of the things to look for actually is the bladder. And I said, see, so the bladder is good. And it was like, it's not good. Wait a second. Something is happening here. That's really important. Uh, I think that's a great point. My, uh, my, my question really has to do with crossing. You went through your crossing, multiple crossing wires and what have you. you know, traditionally, I still go 035 to try to cross these iliacs. And you know, I think there was not much of a you know, kind of stump inferiorly in that common femoral, but a lot of times I will puncture low of the common femoral and keep my distances short. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you, if you considered that, but 035, keeping my distances short, and then if I get into subintimal spaces, I try to communicate in the middle. 
Mm -hmm. That way, at least I can communicate there. I think it's a safer area. True. So what I, what I usually do, I start with NO35. I like a, a Advantage with a very thin knuckle. If it doesn't work, uh, stiff, uh, a stiff straight tipped uh, uh, um, uh, glide wire very carefully. I, I like not to uh, go sub uh, I move to uh, 018, sometimes I just go to Gaia 3rd or, uh, or Confianza. Trying also my best not to, not to go sub at, uh, at uh, any point. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, this is, you know, I brought this patient also uh, back and uh, worked same technique. Uh, uh, I, I opened uh, the, the right side as well, so this is how he looks. Uh, arterial duplex uh, on both sides and ABI normalized. Yeah, I have kind of sim similar sentiments to you, Tino, and I think when you do these uh, external iliac occlusions, you really need to understand your, your lesion length and kind of establish your base of operations and make that lesion as short as possible. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, I don't necessarily uh, disagree with your use of pedal axis, if nothing else, to take that retrograde angiogram with an anterograde angiogram and really understand the lesion. And I suspect at that point you could have potentially gotten ultrasound guided uh, proximal SFA or distal common femoral and still had mm -hmm. a little bit of running room with a seven French sheet to ha have bailout options and um, I, I think that's a really important lesson we all Absolutely. need to be aware of when we're using or, or doing procedures on this segment. True, and uh, for any pedal access, I, I like to, to keep ACT at least like 270 to 300 or 320 all, all the time. And then we use our band and, uh, you know, uh, unlike radial, we wear real light on pressure on our band uh, across the, the, the uh, tibial axis. Just one, one thing that I think might be a good option nowadays is the Turum R2B system with a 6-7 slender, 119. True. These cases were done in 2017. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have, yeah, there, there, there weren't these uh, uh, long sheets yeah. at that time. Well, I think we've learned, I think, I've always tried to go retrograde first, but I think we learned that from, you know, there, there's definitely advantage of being anterograde, you know, yeah. whether you're going up and over or from the wrist, at least having a catheter, at least having something there that you can have some control, yeah. I think it's helpful. The last point is anticoagulation. I usually do not anticoagulate when I'm working the, in the iliacs because of this reason. I mean, usually there's good flow. You know, once I get a crosshand in my channel, then I'll go ahead and anticoagulate. Mm -hmm. But again, it's some area that, one area that I, I'm kind of, I'm usually aggressive, except for here. So. We have one quick question in the back. Unfortunately, a scenario we often see is a stub right at the aorta without a beak, no hypogastric. In this case, you're not hypogastric and beak. If you have a stump at the aorta, is there a strategy to change it all? Well, the right side did have a stump at the, the aorta. Right, right. Same strategy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I used a uh, glide. Actually, uh, that one, I was able to, to open it uh, anterogradely, not retrogradely. I just had a retrograde access to guide my intervention. Uh, so after I crossed, I exchanged it for a seven French sheath because the stents would not, uh, would, would not fit the six French guides. Or, or otherwise, you, you need eight French guides. Uh, which will be a problem. And again, we talked about covered stents for these, you know, class, you know, task D type lesions, C and D lesions. But when you're dealing with that hypogastric and that patient, that hypogastric was really important, mm -hmm. right? The right iliac was occluded. Yep. That was really important. And sometimes yep. that's the trick, right? You almost have to use some kind of hybrid. You want to use covered. And then when you get into a rupture situation, you're like, okay, now yeah. I'm stuck, right? I may have to sacrifice that hypogastric if I can't control the bleeding. So it's, those are a lot of decisions you have to make. True. We, uh, you know, we paid extra attention actually not to lose that one and cover cover where, where it uh, it ruptured. DSA. One of the DSA pictures showed where exactly the, the rupture was, which is like most of the patients. It's it's that uh, that point where it is. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, uh, we'll invite uh, Dr. Garcia to the podium to tell us about the impact of tibial CTO revascularization on pedal perfusion assessed by fluorescence angiography. Long title. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for having me here and uh, Anand Prasad, whose guidance and mentorship have been um, excellent. 
So let's start off with the case. The gentleman is a 61-year-old uh, male. He's got a history of coronary disease, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, diabetic on insulin. He's then stage renal, hypertensive, prior stroke, PAD, status post right, BKA. So he's got all the risk factors. Uh, referred by his podiatrist for management of left lower extremity CLI. Uh, the patient endorses significant rest pain. And here's a picture of his foot. Uh, so a uh, very significant gangrene of his great toe, a large uh, ulcerated uh, ulcer on his third toe, and just significant um, discoloration of the foot. Not something that we like seeing, obviously. So the uh, podiatrist performed something called fluorescence angiography, which I'll go in detail a little bit later in the presentation, but she did it to assist her in determining the level of amputation. Uh, but when she saw this and the areas of white is what shows you perfusion, she saw there's perfusion and some perfusion in the foot, obviously some areas that lack significant perfusion, uh, but some perfusion there. And so that at that point, she decided uh, to re refer to us for potential revascularization. So these are our diagnostic images. So we see on the image of the left, a uh, CTO of the uh, anterior tibial with distal reconstitution of flow. We have a severely diffusely diseased peroneal artery. And in the far picture on the right, you see an incomplete uh, plantar loop with CTO of the dorsalis pedis. I'll give you a moment to take in these images. So the intervention details, we did ultrasound guided left femoral anti-grade axis. Uh, we used a Vions catheter to, you, to cross into the distal um, uh, anterior tibial and it crossed uh, fairly easily, we were surprised. Uh, followed by angioplasty with a 2.0, then a 2.5 to 10 balloon. Unfortunately, we were unable to cross the DPCTO with the other Vions, Pilot 50 or Miracle 6. We then ballooned uh, the peroneal artery with a 2.5 by 30 balloon and these are our final results. So you see here successful recanalization of the anterior tibial CTO. The peroneal artery is left with minimal residual stenosis and no dissection. Uh, the distal runoff in the DP, however, remains impaired, and there's incomplete uh, pedal plantar loop. So the question here now that we ask ourselves in the catheter table, is this enough? Will the patient heal? You know, um, who knows, right? This is his one month follow-up visit. Uh, so his rest pain significantly improved at that point. Uh, he had improved healing of his third toe ulcer, although you can't appreciate it on this picture. And his great toe now has demarcation. This is two months. Uh, no rest pain, continued healing of the third toe ulcer. Actually, it's almost completely healed. And his great toe amputation is healing well. These are some uh, before and after pictures. So uh, we have a very uh, ugly foot on the left and an improved dookie one on the right. And then you see the perfusion assessed in white um, with increased perfusion to the third, uh, the three toes on the foot. And you can see the sort of before and after pictures. Uh, I'll go over this in a little bit more detail. There are ways to uh, provide quantitative analysis of this perfusion, um, which showed improve on this patient as well. So just some objectives. I'm going to go briefly over some of the challenges in CLI, but I want to spend most of the time spending a, li a little bit of time discussing uh, Florence's angiography, uh, just a quick brief review of the literature and how it may be utilized in CLI. Um, so CLI defined when there is significant ischemic rest pain and or lower extremity ulceration when hemodynamic findings incompatible with wound healing. Usually this is an ABI of less than 0.4 or pressures below 30. We know mortality in these patients are high. We know amputation rates are high. And we know re-amputation rates are high in these patients. Living in South Texas, this is very, very true in our, in our uh, community. Uh, revascularization does reduce amputations and remove morbidity. However, a lot remain ischemic and require secondary amputation, and there are lots of challenges in identifying those individuals who would benefit from it. A lot of this is the limitations of our current modalities that we used to assess uh, perfusion. So ABIs um, can be falsely elevated, and I think in this case they were falsely elevated in this patient due to diabetes, age, and CKD. 
TBI, the data is limited. The cutoff is less than 0.7, but this is really not evidence-based. And if you don't have healthy toes, you can't do TBIs. Um, they also don't assist us real well in tracking um, healing either. Um, TCOMs are pretty good, but if you have edema or inflammation, they can be limiting. Uh, skin perfusion pressure, there's probably a lot of da more data on this mechanism to evaluate uh, microcirculatory blood flow. But um, if you can't measure the area with a cuff, um, uh, blood occlusion can be painful to the patient. So quickly, the Luna Fluorensis Angiography System. So this is a diagnostic tool that utilizes IV fluorescent dye. It's called endocyanin green. Um, it sequentially images blood flow in the vessels, microvessels, and the tissue. It uses a low power laser with a coupled device camera to sequence the ICG perfusion at the surface of the skin. So it's not measuring macro vessel, it's uh, measuring perfusion down to the skin. Um, endocyanin green is injected in a peripheral IV. It's safe. Uh, it's non-radioactive, toxicity is low, the only contraindication is iodine allergy. It has a very short half-life, so you can re-image multiple times to get your images in a few minutes. Uh, it's rapidly bound by plasma albulin and undergoes hepatic metabolism, so it can be used in CKD patients uh, safely, which we know a lot of our patients have CKD. Um, the intensity is proportional to the rate of perfusion in the affected tissue. So the wider, the more red the image, the higher the intensity of perfusion. You could do visual and quantitative assessment of wound appearing wound perfusion. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is the way they do quantitative analysis. They measure the intensity of the ICG, the magnitude of the intensity from baseline to peak, which is called the ingress the rate of intensity, um, and then the magnitude and rate of intensity for peak intensity to the end of the study. So these are some of the things the software does already automatically to measure the intensity of the uh, fluorescence dye. So what do we know about uh, its use in PAD and CLI? Well, when I was reading about it, we don't know very much. Uh, most of the data is in helping assess patients' uh, progress on hyperbaric oxygen therapy treatment. So they identify those patients who would benefit and then they follow them after several treatments to see if they're improving to see whether or not to continue it. There have been a few case reports that describe its use in assessing perfusion during lower extremity bypass and in determining the level of amputation. So they'll actually use it in the OR to see if their tibial bypass pr provided enough um, perfusion to allow the, the ulcer to heal. Its use in CLI has been shown in very small studies, uh, but they have in those studies been able to demonstrate increased perfusion and improved healing of the ulcers, although these are very small subset of patients, like 13 patients, when that, that angi particular angiosome underwent targeted intervention. And there has been one study that shows a correlation of improved quantitative parameters, those rates of ingress, ingress rate, and egress rate with improvement in ABI following revascularization. So there's just some data, but not very much. So the true take-home points are that many questions remain. Um, there's no real standard technique in how these procedures are done, lots of variation in the studies, no objective parameter on how to accurately de depict the perfusion, um, no real studies correlating uh, with the improved outcomes. And then one thing that our just mentioned that I thought was interesting is not all patients who undergo revascularization show improved perfusion, and we really don't understand why. Is this loss of collateral vessels, embolization, uh, microvascular dysfunction? So it may, may be helpful to identify which patients will truly benefit from revascularization. It's not widely available. Only one podiatrist utilizes this software in San Antonio, and she does these uh, probably once or twice a month. Is it cost effective? So a lot of answer questions that we still need to answer. Um, but I do think that this case does demonstrate how we can utilize this tool to see if we've uh, improved perfusion, maybe even on the cath lab table, see if our intervention did what it needed to do. Um, and uh, I think it can, uh, we do need to do further study to see how to best utilize. And it does emphasize to me though that managing CLI truly requires a collaborative effort. It wasn't just us who helped this patient heal, but it was the frequent appointments with this podiatrist, the frequent wound care, frequent follow-up. Um, it really is a collaborative effort. Questions? Great presentation, very interesting technology. And again, it's, it's like you said, the availability is something that's not really reimbursed and being able to acquire these type of perfusion assessments in a way to tell us and hopefully give us more information as to what to do would be best, you know, if you could do it in the, on the actual table mm -hmm. so you can make your decision at that time. 
But I, I think, it, especially with your case, it was a good outcome. I think you knew that toe was, you're going to lose that toe. You just wanted to make sure that was going to heal. So. Yeah. I do think there, there is a code for it, and there is reimburses for it. Uh, but whether it's worth it, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, this really is the holy grail of CLI um, mm -hmm. intervention and making sure we have adequate perfusion pressure to the tissue that needs it. And right now, our tools are really limited. I just want to uh, make the point that ABIs are normal or near normal in a third of our CLI patients, so that's mm -hmm. garbage and you shouldn't use it. So in my practice, I really try to use toe brachial indices and toe systolic pressure specifically, although it's not the... Um, uh, uh, the, the best, and you can't use it, obviously, in people with TMA. Mm -hmm. So that's where this really comes in nice. We, uh, when I was at Cleveland Clinic, uh, Dr. Shishabor used this um, uh, a bit as we were mm -hmm. studying it. And one of the things we found is um, it was really challenging to know um, that change from some, uh, we, we did a pre-procedure in the office, and then we did Luna afterwards. And so I wanted to ask you um, uh, both monitoring in the office with this device and then post-procedure, what's the utility? And then the timing post-procedure. So there's a lot of changes and sometimes we see kind of crummy runoff with really high peripheral vascular resistance, particularly at the farther distal you go. Does this, does this testing change two hours post-procedure, six hours, 12 hours the next day? What are your thoughts on that? That's a good question, and I, I think we really don't know. Um, honestly, we, we, the reason the podiatrist did the post-imaging is because we asked. We wanted to know what, how improv, perfusion improved. But I would assume that if the surgeons were able to demonstrate it in a few cases that when they do bypass, uh, perfusion Im improves in that toe, then that maybe we could use it um, right during the cath case. But again, we, we deal with more smaller vessels. So in all honesty, I don't think we really know the answer to that. And CLI really is a multidisciplinary thing and um, to the point of just good nutrition and this being bound to albumin, how do you think folks with really poor nutrition, low albumin, how that might affect how this immunofluorescent is going to, you know, your counts, how you're going to register counts or account for that in those sorts of patients? Do you think it'll matter? You know, I don't with my limited experience, I really don't think it'll matter, but because uh, I think it'll show sort of relative perfusion. So maybe you'll at least be able to see some areas better than others, maybe not light up as well, but I don't think it'll matter. But in all honesty, um, I don't know the answer to that question. All right, thank you very much. Thank it was you. a great presentation. All right, we're, we're making good progress. Uh, next, I'll invite to the podium uh, Dr. Quaish, who is gonna tell us about a combined radial and pedal axis to treat a flush chronic total occlusion of the SFA in a CLI patient. Thank you. Uh, how do you... Okay. Well, uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Kais. Um, basically, my disclosures here, I am a hospitalist in internal medicine, and I uh, uh, follow Dr. Shamas, who is the primary operator in this case at uh, Midwest Cardiovascular Research Foundation. So the case that I have here is a, a combined radial and pedal axis to treat a flush uh, occlusion of the SFA in a CLI patient. Uh, no disclosures to this case. Um, this is a 52-year-old uh, male patient with type 2 diabetes, uh, peripheral artery disease, had a, a left AKA amputation a few weeks prior, uh, has non-healing wounds on his left stump and also has uh, wounds on his right foot. Uh, unfortunately, continues to smoke. He was referred for a revascularization for a non-healing ulcer on his right foot. Exams relevant for a, uh, uh, on the left stump, he had a wound vac, and he had developed new ulcers in his right uh, foot. Uh, prior angiogram to uh, this presentation from a right common femoral axis showed occlusion to his distal left external iliac uh, up to his left uh, proximal SFA. So approach at that time was to stent his uh, proximal external iliac and uh, given that he had collaterals feeding the uh, uh, distal stump, there was no further intervention at that time. Now the patient is back for a uh, uh, stage treatment for her, uh, the, uh, the osteal SFA on the right side, and uh, this is basically the case. So uh, clearly there is an axis side challenge in this case. Uh, contralateral axis is not an option 
given the severe disease, the occlusion basically in his uh, uh, left uh, uh, iliac. Also, a uh, uh, anti-grade access to teeth and osteal lesion is also not uh, the best option here. So um, the plan here was to proceed with a uh, uh, radial axis and a dual approach with a uh, dorsalis pedis axis. So given the recent release of uh, long wires and long balloons from Terumo um, that are currently at a pre-market stage in the U.S., uh, they have been used in Europe, but at the moment they are in a pre-market trial in the U.S. This had helped in this uh, case, and this case will illustrate the feasibility of using the radial and the pedal approach for such an osteal legion. This image here shows the, uh, uh, on the right side here, this is the pedal axis with a five French, six French cylinder. This is the radial axis, and this long, uh, this is actually a sheath, a 118 centimeter radial sheath that was uh, required to be placed afterward. So details of the procedure, um, the Rosales pedis was obtained via micropuncture technique. Um, six French, five French uh, cylinder was used uh, immediately for 100 mics of IV nitro and 4,000 units of IV uh, heparin were uh, administered. Uh, radial artery was uh, accessed with a six French cylinder. Um, Woolly wire was advanced, uh, pigtail was utilized, and uh, um, iliac runoffs were done and uh, it was noted to have a uh, occlusion in the osseous of AL as well as occlusion in the left uh, iliac uh, arteries. So the radial sheath here was exchanged to the long destination, 118 centimeter to Romo sheath. Uh, woolly wire was exchanged for a 400 centimeter uh, 0.035 uh, uh, angled stiff, and a glide uh, sheath was advanced over that. Now this, sorry, this sheath was placed into, uh, and the wire were placed into the profunda. Contrast injection was done, and it did visualize a uh, reconstitution of the distal SFA up to the pop. Um, now, the catheter was pulled back to the common femoral, so proper visualization with further uh, contrast injection will be utilized. Uh, from the pedal uh, retrogradely, a uh, navicross was advanced over a 260 uh, guide wire advantage wire, and uh, the attempt was to do a retrograde crossing for this legion. Now, the catheter and the wire from the pedal axis were advanced up to the proximal SFA. Uh, unfortunately, it was at the, almost at the tip of the SFA. It was not to be in a subintimal space, despite uh, escalating wires, multiple wire techniques, a stato 40 gem, uh, V18, uh, the wire not to be in a subintimal location, as you can see here. So the uh, black arrow shows the four flange glide sheets from the radial axis. It's almost this is a really tall patient who was like five, six, sorry, six, five. And you can see that the tip there of the uh, uh, glide sheath up to the almost distal common femoral. From the retrograde axis, you can see the navicross with the uh, glide wire um, noted to be in a subintimal space there. Um, there was like a rock basically sitting in that space that was really difficult to uh, attempt. So at that point, um, uh, discussion uh, and the idea was to why not to cross from the anti-grade approach so just passing the 400 centimeter uh, uh, long wire from the uh, radial approach uh, crossing was successful um, this wire was advanced down to the SFA uh, and distally and over this wire uh, it was uh, uh, noted to be in an intimal uh, location and we can show that in the next image uh, over this, a 200 centimeter uh, monorail 6 by 100 metacross balloon by Turumo was uh, used. Dilation of the entire SFA segment was carried out. And um, uh, from the retrograde approach, from the pedal sheet, a V18 wire was used. It was advanced up to the uh, uh, distal aorta. And uh, uh, stenting was necessary in this case. With the use of the silver PTX from the pedal axis, two stents were deployed in the proximal and med SFA and the distal SFA was treated with a Lutonix balloon with good 5% uh, residual narrowing. So this image on the left shows crossing from the anti-grade approach. Um, as you can see, the wire is almost touching the Navicross uh, distal uh, catheter. And this image here shows both wires anti-gradely and uh, retrogradely to be uh, in the true lumen. Uh, further uh, treatment to the CFA was required. Uh, the use of Lutonix balloon was uh, uh, administered to uh, uh, the CFA. 
Uh, unfortunately, a type C dissection was noted that uh, uh, required the placement of a stent, and this stent was placed to the proximal and mid uh, CFA, leaving the uh, distal portion free from stenting. Uh, it was a live stent. This image shows the dissection and the common femoral artery. This is the final image here showing a uh, stent in the common femoral, stenting in the osteal SFA and the mid-SFA. So what was uh, helpful in this case and uh, uh, really helped out was the available or availability of the radial tools by uh, Turomo, the 118 centimeter destination sheath, the uh, long guide wire, uh, uh, angled glide wire for 100 centimeter and the Metacross RX balloon. Um, so uh, the anti-grade axis here was really important. It visualized the bifurcation of the common femoral. It uh, enabled visualization of the profunda and to protect the profunda in an attempt to treat an osteal SFA. Also, crossing was actually uh, done in this case from the anti-grade approach. And uh, now the new tools that are available by, uh, in the US at the current uh, pre-market stage enabled an, uh, a really effective opportunity to treat this case from a radial approach. Now, they are limited to uh, long wires, long crossing catheters, and long balloons up to 200. Unfortunately, there is no stent uh, that can reach from the radial axis down to the SFA. There is no DCB balloons from that axis, and there is no treatment to the tibial vessels from a uh, radial axis. Uh, so this was, uh, pedal axis was uh, needed to be coupled uh, to uh, treat this case. Um, the pedal axis here provided an alternative approach to cross the lesion. Uh, although crossing was not successful, but it enabled the anti-grade crossing as it provided like an anatomical guidance where you can see the Navicross uh, wire in the uh, SFA. So it enabled the operator to easily cross from an anti-grade approach. So finally, this case illustrates a approach of a dual and a, p a radial and a pedal axis to treat a flush SFA occlusion. Thank you. We're short on time, but I think this shows where we are going with the technology. I think we still have a lot to learn. You know, is it is a pedal going to be safer than, let's say, a popliteal puncture in this case? Is you know, are we limited in terms of what you can really put in through a pedal and, and you know, stent delivery and what have you? Very interesting case, very complicated case. But I think as we see more more work going to the outpatient situation, I can see us trying to figure out how to safely do this from a pedal and radial approach. So that's my comment. I don't know if any comments we go to the next. Yeah, any comments? Uh, I think we're just going to keep those engineers sure. busy at these companies to work on smaller and smaller equipment. Um, I just had one comment. Yeah. You know, um, and I was curious to see what Tino thought about the placement of the common femoral stent with that short uh, segment of gap. And of course, instant uh, restenosis really occurs in that in segment yep. outside of stents. And so you've now got a, a pretty high likelihood of potential instant restenosis. So in this case, would you have <laughs> stented across that profunda into the common femoral to uh, minimize that potential? Yeah, I mean, I think in this situation, you are trying to put as, as less stent as possible. Uh -huh. And I think that's, you know, they treat it with the DCB first. So hopefully that drug is there and will help with restenosis. We don't know. The truth is we don't know. But I think there I try to minimize the amount of stenting. A lot of people have talked about putting a Supera stent in the common femoral. I don't really do that. I try not to stent. Right. So I think that's what they were trying to do, minimize the stent and not jail the profund. I think the profund yeah. is key. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. All right. So last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Amrod, who's going to tell us about retrograde tibial pedal access as a bailout procedure for endovascular intervention complications. Dr. Amrod. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. My name is Ahmed Amro. I'm a second year general cardiology fellow at Marshall University. I have no disclosures. So my presentation will be retrograde pedal access as bailout procedure for uh, endovascular intervention complications. 
Uh, our patient is a 76-year-old female patient with history of diabetes, hypertension, CAD, and smoking. She presented complaining of intermittent severe claudication in her left leg with a Rutherford classification of 3. Her left leg ABI was 0.61. Pre-intervention angiogram showed totally occluded mid-SFA that reconstitute at the distal SFA, which was patent as shown here in this image. While trying to cross the totally occluded mid-SFA using the conventional uh, CFA axis, perforation developed just exactly uh, at the edge of the region, as shown here, just exactly at the edge. So the wire was exchanged with a glide wire gold in an attempt to cross the region, which was unsuccessful. So the catheter was removed, and ever cross balloon was inflated uh, at two atmosphere proximal to the region in, in an attempt to tamponade the bleeding. Access then was obtained through the left posterior tibial artery using an ultrasound, and the sixth French glide sheath was inserted that was followed by the antispasmodic cocktail. Then a glide tape wire was inserted through the pedal sheath, along with Navicross catheter that was successful in crossing the totally occluded mid SFA. After the catheter was removed, Everflex self expanding stent was inserted and deployed in the mid SFA. So, in this case, coming retrogradely, created a flap that sealed the perforation without the need to uh, use a covered stent. Angiogram revealed like resolution of the perforation as shown here. So to minimize the risk of access vessels from pulses, the pedal sheath and deployment system were then removed uh, as soon as the stent was deployed. Hemostasis was achieved by holding pressure for 10 minutes. So in this case, a quick pedal access was safe, practical, and timely critical in managing SFA perforation while maintaining balloon tamponade above the region. Hence, traditional tamponade across the region in this case was not possible due to the site of perforation, which was exactly at the edge of the region. Another point to bring uh, here is that retrograde access allowed us to create a retrograde flap, which completely sealed the perforation without the need to uh, use cover stent. Two important factors for successful retrograde pedal approach here are adequate knowledge and training as it is an evolving approach and attaining duplex ultrasound knowledge and interpretation is crucial here. So as a home point, retrograde pedal access is safe and effective approach for delivery of stents from distal approach and can be used as bailout technique for SFA perforation and physicians or interventionists involved in peripheral intervention will require having a full understanding of this approach and acquiring the necessary skills to perform it safely and effectively to be able to finish what they started. Thank you. I think in, especially in light of all the cases we saw today, this is a, a very good case. Uh, again, discussing you know, what to do and using the pedal approach, particularly here as a bailout. Um, do you think that you know, first of all, did the patient have any symptoms, whatever? How much bleeding do you think there was? And was the balloon, how important was that balloon tamponade from, from the, from, from the you know, anti-grade uh, approach? It was bleeding quite significant, as shown on the angiogram. So, I mean, we could not just let it go, especially we could not tamponade it. It was just exactly at the edge, like you could not cross the wire and to, like, tamponade that bleeding. There was no way to stop that bleeding. And it was not side branch, it was the SFA. Good case again. Uh, what, what is the mechanism again? This was a wire perf, right? So it was wire perf just like where's the cap of the CTO. So the wire just passed beside it and created a flap. So it was just perf, actual perf. But it was not just like before it or after we crossed the cap. We did not even cross. It was just at the edge. Because usually wire perfs are managed very conservatively. You don't, you know, you do a balloon tamponade prolonged balloon tamponade, and most of those are self-limiting. Mm -hmm. so. okay. yeah, one of the challenges with these uh, CTOs is the collaterals that come off can sometimes be the actual source of perforation, and um, just by ballooning, them, ballooning the main vessel, uh, you don't necessarily exclude the bleeding from that daughter mm -hmm. vessel through retrograde perfusion, it can still be an issue. Also, the retrograde here was to cross the region also, because you cannot even try to cross the region while there is perf, even if we tamponade it and stop that bleeding, then we have to leave that legion. But coming from below, we treated the legion and we treated the perf at the same time, and we did not even have to use a covered stent. We just used like self-expandable stent because we sealed the flap.
Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you for everybody's attention for this session. And that'll conclude the session. Thank you.